In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thornstein Veblen. I never thought it would be a sermon with Thornstein Veblen, but it is a name of great gravitas, don't you think? With a name like that, and so with some really awesome facial hair, which he undoubtedly had, just go to Wikipedia and see a picture of him. With a hair like that, facial hair like that, and with a name like that, you were going to make some history. And, and Thornstein Veblen made some history. In 1899, he coined the term conspicuous consumption. Conspicuous consumption describes the behavior of spending loads of money, the acquisition of goods and services, for the purpose of displaying economic power. This obviously is a very niche behavior because very few of us have the kind of resources to actually pull this off. But wait, there is something that's more, there's something more. Veblen's conspicuous consumption was spun off into two different uh, directions. First was the idea that conspicuous individual who participates in any kind of ostentatious consumerism, regardless of social rank, that is meant to elicit the envy of others. I love to have Veblen come back from the dead and give us his thoughts on Facebook and social media. These are platforms specially designed for the conspicuous individual. Now they have some positives, obviously, but what happens a lot on Facebook? Look at the pics of my new car, my new house, my perfect family, all nestled lovely on the couch in our beautiful sweaters. <laughs> or read my views that show off my $100,000 education, which, by the way, are better and more superior than your views. Social media is the lifeblood of the conspicuous individual. The second offshoot, though, of Evelyn's idea is conspicuous compassion. It's the giving of charity for the express interest of enhancing social prestige. <clears throat> the artery that pumps the conspicuous compassion of blood into our society is philanthropy, which has been corporatized in the last decade and a half into robust marketing strategies that while providing, yes, very positively, providing fundraising dollars to such and such a cause, has also overwhelmingly been used to increase individual and corporate social standing. So putting it together now, Veblen's insight is that part of the reason we spend money is for power. And part of the reason why that power is important to us is that we are afraid of losing social standing. Power in many ways can be, can be positive. So this is in no ways uh, an anti-power rant. It's more of an insight into how power is being used. Conspicuousness is using power out of fear in order to save my own personal social standing. Enhancing would be even better, but the fright revolves around losing any of it. Before you begin, begin to think that this is all just kind of niche, it's those rich folks on the coast, it's those rich folks in Dallas that are the role of conspicuous consumers, all concerned about their social status. The gospel brings it right into our own neighborhood. It's easy for us to hear our gospel read to us and to think automatically those scribes. Thoseism. Now that's my term that I've coined. I don't have the facial hair or the name to back it up, but I want full credit for it. That's my term. <laughs> Thoseism is a very destructive way to read the Bible. It takes characters and situations that are meant to be a mirror for us so we can examine ourselves. And it instead regards them as merely those people and those situations. We easily remove ourselves away from the story. We take ourselves out of it. And what scripture is asking us to do is to see ourselves in the story. How are those scribes us? How am I a scribe? A conspicuous agent concerned more about my social rank than the beauty of truth and wisdom. Now, it wasn't supposed to be this way. A scribe from the time of Jesus was to be a purveyor of wisdom. They were to acquire master skills in reading and writing in the areas of law and theology. Since Jewish law was the basis of all 
a common life, the basis of justice and religion and culture, a scribe was influential in every single part of that culture. For that reason, they were required to have a very broad education, to learn more about the wisdom of the ancients, to observe the people as they traveled broadly and widely throughout the whole region so they could know the cares and concerns of the people, to be spiritually formed by daily prayer and by uh, religious rituals. They were trained for the kingdom of heaven. They were to live a life in, that, in the kingdom of man in order that they might in that kingdom, in that kingdom, shed the light of a more wise, divine kingdom to come. But the accusation, the accusation coming from Jesus is that they did the complete opposite. <coughs> Instead of living a life that pursues wisdom, they bogged themselves down in conspicuous living. Instead of liberation of truth, they chose the shackles of living in fear, always worried and concerned about their own social rank. Oh, what is going to be my Q rating today? How are people going to perceive me? And that worldview determined their behaviors. The ostentatiousness of their practices was nauseating to Jesus. The extent that he warns his followers to be aware, beware, to be aware of such poison. Don't regard them as wise, but see them for who they really are. They're fools. He shames who they become by making light of their practices. The walking around in large, long, flowing robes, the glad handing and back slapping in places specially designed to garner attention, the sitting in the first seats in the synagogues. They're always partly faced out toward the congregation. The reclining on the couches at the best banquets in town, which were the seats of honor. The swallowing of widows' estates, as these scribes were made trustees over these estates, and they took full advantage of these folks by charging unnecessary and exorbitant fees. The long prayers designed to be soliloquies of their own eloquence, instead of heartfelt petitions to the divine. These were all rituals of conspicuousness. They didn't spread wisdom. They maintained social power. These men were truly hypocrites. They pretended to have virtue. They did not know. And while they gave of themselves, they did give of themselves. They only did it to keep it or try to enhance what was most important to them. The social status that gave them power. They created for themselves a whole world of conspicuous consumption. Conspicuous compassion. So give, but do it for the express interest of increasing your social prestige. Now the contrast between that and the subsequent story is very, very striking. It's still about two humans. The one is the true scribe, meaning he is truly wise. He uses his training to be watchful, looking to encourage, to enhance, to bring to light to make conspicuous something that is truly good. He doesn't care about social standing because what he does next defiles all of that. All he cares about is making the good shine brighter so that others can see it and learn from it. The other human is most unlikely for gaining any special attention. So the three rule, the three strike rule in effect here, let's just play the game. First, She's poor. Second, she's a she. She's a woman. And third, she's a widow. No special divine favor upon this one. Because no wealth, not a man. And when she had a man, she lost him. Which is apparently evidence that whatever favor was upon her was then removed because of something bad that she did. She is poor in every respect. But is what is most important is what is said after those six words. She is poor in every respect according to the kingdom of man. In that kingdom, wealth, privilege, power, access are most important. What these things and the people who have these things contribute is most desired. It's most desired because whether you like it or not, that those people and the people that have these things build the world. The continual number one reason why people go to the polls and vote the way they do, we all know this, revolves around one thing, and that's the economy. 
The whole ecosystem of wealth, privilege, access, and power interact. And that's the value, that's the goal of the kingdom of man. But the great scribe is a wise man who comes from a whole different kingdom. He observes something that others would regard as insignificant. Why? Because when an inconsequential person does anything, it necessarily means that it's inconsequential. Jesus, however, sees this poor woman widow. And out of a whole crowd of people, she is the one who stands out to them. This person who is last in every respect will, in this moment, become first. It's her act of charity that he chooses to make conspicuous. He not only compliments her and her gracious action, but he does what we see him continually do in the Gospels, which is he drives to the heart. I will admit that it's easy for us to get distracted here. We, in fact, are Americans, and we are so money-obsessed that that is what we want to always place our focus upon. John Chrysostom, in his reading of this passage, warns against this tendency. Jesus paid no attention to the money, to the two coins. Rather, Chrysostom says, the true scribe gives heed to our heart. For if you calculate the value of her money, her poverty is great, and she's insignificant. But if you do as Jesus did, and examine her heart's intention, her act of generosity is incalculable. Those others gave out of abundance. It didn't hurt them. She gave out of her heart's intention. A sacrificial offering that actually cost her everything. Now this is not to romanticize some notion of sacrificial giving uh, that is more akin to uh, self-flagellation. The part that uh, claims that she gave everything and, and all that she had to live on is in my reading of the passage at least, you can buy it or not, but in my reading of the passage, it's somewhat hyperbolic. I would not advise anyone to make this a normative practice. And I also don't believe this comment by Jesus was uh, directed exclusively at monetary giving, the giving of money. Now, I think we know by now the problems that come with romanticizing such practices. We've seen in history the acolytes of Johann Tensel, who used to stand in the streets of Rome in the 16th century to entice Christian pilgrims who came from all over the world coming to Rome, and to try to get them to place, and whatever they can do, to place money in the chest for the reconstruction of St. Peter's Basilica. And what was that little jingle they used to use that became so famous? As soon as a coin in the bowl does ring, a soul from purgatory does surely spring. It's catchy. I like it. Yes, give your money, and it will automatically give to you the grace of God. It's as easy as pressing a button on your iPhone. There's no relationship there. Only machine. What a dastardly way to treat God's grace. And that is to say nothing of the barbarous practices of so-called Christian preachers who have radios and televisions across our land. Taking full advantage of the lack of regulations and they move to pillage people's pocketbooks for their own financial gain. So yes, there is a great danger in romanticizing sacrificial giving. But remember that those practices are nothing more than conspicuous compassion. What Jesus cares about isn't the coin. It's the heart. It's the heart of this woman. And what he sees there is quiet humility. Not one giving to increase social standing, but one giving to the Lord. And I believe that he himself sees himself in that act. It's the quiet humility that will soon bring him into the garden. It will sacrifice his will on the altar. And what comes out of that struggle at Gethsemane, as Jesus fully realizes the cup of suffering that he would be asked to endure, what comes out of that struggle is a steadfast confidence in his Father. Though I will descend into the depths of death, he will bring me up and restore me. A confident faith in the character of God is the only thing that makes sacrifice worthwhile. Jesus sees in this woman's charity her willingness to bear the cost because of her remarkable confidence 
in her God. And that is what makes this woman so remarkable. It's the same confidence we see in the story of Ruth. The confidence that comes from realizing you worship a God who sees you and knows you. He sees you and knows you just as he saw and knew the widow of Mark chapter 12. Just as he saw and knew Naomi and her family and their flight. After death has, has struck some very mighty blows to Naomi and her family, the existence of that family was now in danger. But as the women testify in chapter 4, God is a restorer of life. If you want to know more about how God restored their life, read the book of Ruth. He sees the poor and he restores the poor to new life. Perhaps the widow who so sacrificially gave did it with the story of Ruth in mind. Maybe as she heard portions of the book of Ruth read constantly in liturgical practices of her day, she saw in Ruth and Naomi's narrative, a narrative of her own life. And as she remembered that God is a restorer of life, perhaps she so sacrificially gave, because she knew that while God restores life in this life, He will restore life more fully in the life to come. True treasure is not gained in this life, but in the next. That life, as Hebrews tells us, will appear after Christ comes a second time. On that day, he won't be coming to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. So have faith. And demonstrate that faith by laying up for yourselves, as this woman did, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where the moth and rust of conspicuousness are not found. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.